Welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Phil Arno. Every one of us living our lives day to day have challenges. Life puts many obstacles in our way, things that can throw a curve as we struggle to survive. Each one of us, of course, is different. Some people can't seem to catch a break. Call it fate, maybe bad luck. Some people, though, go through life with challenges that, thankfully, can be dealt with and handled. And then there are people who have a special kind of cha challenge, whether it's behavioral or something in the genetics. Addiction is a nasty vexation that is the ruin of many people throughout our society. My guest today is a fascinating individual who has sampled the very best of life and the very worst. Spencer Christian has been on top. He's rubbed elbows with six United States presidents, and met and had conversations with more famous people than I'm sure he can even remember. As a reporter and a weatherman who spent more than 10 years on Good Morning America at its peak, Spencer reached the top fame, wealth, and at the same time, a great family. You might see, say he was at the top of his game although that would probably be a bad choice of words. You see, Spencer, like many people, had an addiction. Or maybe I should say he has an addiction, for as far as I know, nobody ever really gets rid of an addiction. In his case, the addiction is gambling. It cost him his wealth, his family, and certainly much of his peace of mind. Spencer has a book out, You Can Bet Your Life. It's about his journey and with me today to explain what he's gone through, Spencer Christian. Good Welcome to the show, show. Spencer. You. Good to be here. Um, it's, it's been a long journey. Yeah. Of course, you've done a lot of talk shows. You've hosted many, many shows over the years. Maybe you should take over the interview. <laughs> no, you no, probably no, have no. a lot more experience than I do. I, I'd it. rather be a guest, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the easy part. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it, let's start with the, with the difficult question. Yeah. You know, how can a guy intelligent, successful, uh, really on top, be so influenced, so dominated by something like gambling to the point where time after time, not just once, but time after time, it put you into such a hole that you had reached bottom. Yeah. Phil, I, I wish I had the answer to that and I'm still trying to find the answer to that because when I began gambling compulsively, uh, and began to recognize the, the grip that it was, it was having, holding on me. Um, I started asking myself that question then. I, I couldn't think of any void in my life that I was trying to fill. Uh, I had a happy life at home. Uh, I, w I was married, I was raising my kids. I had certainly uh, reached that, the, the pinnacle of my career at the time that gambling really started to take hold. So I was, I was fulfilled and gratified by my work. I loved going home and being with my wife and kids. Um, I, I could not identify what it was if, if, in fact, there was a void I was trying to, to fill. But I do remember the, the rush that I felt the first few times I gambled, the thrill of raking in you know, a big stack of chips and cashing in, that, cashing in those chips and putting the cash in my pocket and being, getting the high roller treatment you know, at the casinos. And, the, the fancy sweets and the gourmet meals and all that sort of thing. Uh, there was something about that that was so compelling for me, even when I was losing and feeling miserable inside, I didn't want to give it up. Now, this wasn't something that you have always uh, uh, experienced. You didn't start gambling until you were like 30 years old. That's right. I, I was already fairly well established in my career. I, I grew up poor, so I, you know, I didn't have wealth and luxury around me growing up and I had overcome the adversity of what we call deprivation in my childhood and um, and here I was now in this dream job with the dream family wonderful wife two wonderful kids and I had um, I was already filling in on Good Morning America I hadn't arrived full-time at Good Morning America yet it was the late 1970s but I had arrived at a prominent position on WABC TV in New York when casino gambling opened up in Atlantic City, 1978. Uh, I had played poker with the guys after work on a Friday night, so, but I'd never had the casino experience, so I wanted to go and see what that was like. 
So I went down to Atlantic City for a weekend to meet a buddy of mine, an old poker buddy of mine. But there was no poker in the casinos then. So we played slot machines, we played roulette, we played blackjack. And my first couple trips were winning trips. <laughs> and then I said to my wife, we need to go to Las Vegas to see what that's like. So we took our first uh, vacation in Las Vegas. And I, blackjack was my primary game at that point. And I happened to win a little money on that trip, maybe about uh, twelve, fourteen hundred dollars $1,400. And I was hooked. I couldn't wait to go back and do it again, just thinking that I had mastered the system. Uh, and that's how it all started. Well, you, I think, like, like myself, grew up in a, you know, a, a family. Uh, my, my parents lived through the Depression. Mm -hmm. And my dad, I can remember going through the house. He would come around and turn all the lights off in the house. Yeah. And sometimes when I was still in the room. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it was one of those things where you never wasted anything and you, you know, you basically, you know, had values that held on to, you know, whatever you had and mm -hmm. tried to be efficient. Right. And I, I remember going into a, a casino the first time and sitting there with my sweaty palms and my $2 bets. Yeah. And the guy next to me was, was betting $500 at a crack. Right. And I just, I, I couldn't justify putting that money out there and the possibility of losing it, the yeah. hard-earned money, yeah. you know, maybe from my, my childhood experiences uh, and the upbringing and, and how hard my parents worked, did that ever really, I mean, you had, had gotten to the point where you were making a lot of income, right. but in the back of your mind, I mean, because of your parents' background and because of your upbringing, didn't you ever think, well, maybe this isn't, this is a, a waste, yes. it's a waste. Yeah, I, I did, but by the time I started asking that question seriously to myself, I was already hooked. When I first began uh, frequenting the casinos, I, would, I often thought about the fact that here I was making you know, $100 bets, $200 bets, uh, and I reflected on my childhood and my upbringing and the struggles my parents had in trying to provide just the, the basic necessities. Um, and, and I asked myself, why am I doing this? And then. But by the time, as I said, by the time I started asking that question of myself seriously, I was already hooked on gambling and I was ashamed of myself because I was thinking, what if people knew, I thought of myself as a pretty smart guy, what if people who know me at work or my neighbors who know me uh, knew what trouble I'm getting into with this, how, what would they think of me? They would think I'm stupid, they would think I'm, I'm not smart. What would my parents think of me? They'd be embarrassed, they'd be disappointed. All those things went through my mind, and yet I still felt this uncontrollable urge, and I just couldn't get it out of my system. At least at that point, I couldn't. Well, you mentioned in your book uh, a lot of very strong personalities as you were growing up. You know, Mrs. Johnson, I believe. Oh, uh, oh Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. One of my favorite teachers. Uh, Mrs. Jefferson. Mrs. Jefferson. Mrs. Montague. Mon okay. Montague. <laughs> you know, all people who put you on the right path yeah. and helped actually to probably get you the success that you earned. Yeah. Uh, very strong upbringing, you know, and for, for those of the people watching now, it just doesn't get any better than that. What, it's a success story. Now, you're not a psychiatrist, but getting into the mechanics of an addiction, mm -hmm. in your particular case, is it, was it, could it just be explained as a behavioral problem, or could it be something deeper routed in, yeah. in your genetic makeup, or just are you basically open to that kind of a problem? I could be. I mean, there is such a thing as, uh, as an addictive personality. Um, and I've thought about this a lot, and, and I've been asked this question before. And when I reflect on it, I can't, <clears throat> I can't think of another uh, time in my life uh, when I was engaged in anything that, that made me feel compelled to do it all the time, the way gambling did. I mean, I, I've talked uh, uh, to other reporters and interviewers about having the baseball card collection when I was a kid. I was so passionate about having every card that was available in that series, I, and I memorized every player's stats, but when baseball season ended, I forgot about the card collection. So uh, I, I don't think uh, there's any other facet of my life uh, which parallels the, the pull that I felt to gambling. So I don't know that I have an addictive personality, but when I, maybe I'm overdiagnosing, but maybe the fact that I grew up a poor black kid in the old segregated South where I faced 
uh, you know, signs every day telling me where I could and could not go. Um, maybe there's something about those indignities uh, and, and the injustice of it all and, and, you know, the fact that we struggle, that we were poor. Maybe there's something about that experience that uh, caused me when I reached a, a better, more comfortable station in life to want to be a bad boy. You know, I'd been a good boy all my life. I'd always worked hard and studied hard and was the first kid raising his hand to answer the questions and never stepped out of line on the way to the lunchroom. Uh, I didn't break curfews when I was growing up and my parents gave me the, the freedom to go out at night. Um, I was a good boy all my life. Maybe there was some part of me that wanted to be the bad boy. Now that I didn't have to be accountable to parents and teachers and authority figures anymore, I could, I could go out and gamble and be the bad boy. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> it, it, you think it's a cathartic experience? Do you think it's something that's prompted you to write the book, to, to maybe tell your story, to help other people? Oh, no doubt about it, yeah. I, I, I couldn't wait to tell my story. Once I reached a point where I felt that um, I was recovering from gambling and would never gamble again, and I certainly feel that way, then I wanted to tell the story because it was a cathartic experience, writing about it, revealing it, and it was, it was almost like a cleansing confession. It relieved me of a burden of guilt and shame that had built up for so many years while I was gambling, especially during the last 10 years or so, maybe even last 20 years. Uh, 10 years into my 30 years of compulsive gambling, I, I knew for sure I had a problem. And I was desperate to find ways to deal with the debt that I had accumulated. And I was constantly you know, taking out extra mortgages in the house or extra credit lines here and there, juggling all the debt, but was unwilling to give up gambling or to try to even find a way to, to quit. The last 10 years or so that I gambled, it was not fun. It was, it was stressful, it was painful. Uh, I was just trying to recoup losses. Uh, it was so stressful and, and um, it produced so much anxiety that when I finally reached the point where I knew I was ready to give it up, I just felt relieved of a burden. And that's what writing this book did for me. It, it allowed me to say, okay, I'm a flawed individual and look at how wasteful and irresponsible I've been and I'm really sorry, uh, and I hope my kids will forgive me, and I hope the people whose lives I affected, who care about me, will forgive me. This is my confession. So I couldn't wait to tell the story. Well, your career has, uh, has really gone full circle. I mean, you, you started in TV uh, about the time I started in radio. It's a tremendous business, as we talked about before uh, uh, the show. It's a window to the world. Yeah. You get to sample just about everything there is in this world. Uh, very lucky to be in the business. You reach the, the pinnacle of, of our business, certainly, on a, a, a network show. Yeah. Uh, experience the very best. It's kind of come full circle now. You've gotten more chances than you probably think you ever were going to get or deserved, and yet you, you've survived and you've come back, you're now on the air in San Francisco. That's right. Yeah. And uh, you've, uh, at least, now the journey's not over, but you're, you're in control at this point. Yes, at um, this point, yeah. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's a, in the end, it seems to be a good story that you're telling. I, I, yeah, I, I tell people that the story has a happy ending, you know. Uh, uh, people who have not read the book but know something about what, uh, something about my story say, Oh, that must be so so sad and so. And I say, yeah, you know, there were many sad moments, and 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 there was a lot of self-destructive behavior, and you know, I I obviously did some damage to the relationships that were most important to me. Certainly damaged myself spiritually, financially. Uh, but the book has a happy ending. Um, I I I'm in recovery, as you say. I feel no urge to go into a casino or to ever gamble again. Uh, my kids have always loved me, but now they respect and admire me again for the wiser choices I'm making. Um, and at, at 71, I still have, thankfully, my health and uh, a great zest for life, and I'm still gainfully employed, still in the ABC family. In this business, that's, yeah. a good, that's an so, accomplishment in itself. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a happy guy. I'm in, I'm in a really good, peaceful, joyful place. I wish I had all the money I lost. <laughs> I, you know, I wish I had invested uh, more wisely and, and saved. Uh, I didn't. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I've been poor and broke before, and, uh, and now I'm recovering from being poor and broke again. 
Well, that's a, it's an encouraging uh, uh, story in, in that respect. Um, let's talk a little bit about what it was like to be on network TV uh. and get into the, to the positives of, of this life. Uh, you got to see more than, than you know, a lot of people do in an entire lifetime. Just in the short time you've been in the business, you've gone throughout the world mm -hmm. and, and, and you've, uh, again, met people that are fascinating stories. Uh, tell us a little bit about the experience of being on Good Morning America. It's uh, the most rewarding and fulfilling professional experience, not only that in my entire career of 47 years, but it's, it's, it was more rewarding and more fulfilling than I could have ever imagined. Now, I was in, in college in the late 60s during that student activism generation. I worked in political campaigns. I marched against the war in Vietnam, and I dreamed of becoming a journalist because I was so fascinated by the way the news media covered the events of the late 60s that I decided I want to be in that news media and be one of those reporters. So I came into the business as a reporter. I was asked to fill in on weather, though, early in my career. And during that time, I was just filling in on weather. I became a hit, if you will, and was encouraged to stay on in weather full time. I never could have, pardon the pun, forecast early in my career <laughs> that that little change in career direction would have taken me where it has taken me. But that's what got me to New York, to WABC, and then eventually on to Good Morning America. When I arrived at Good Morning America, uh, my very visionary boss, Phil Buth there, uh, gave me the freedom to pursue all of my interests uh, and all of my passions as a reporter, apart from doing weather every day. I mean, he certainly wanted me to be his regular weather guy every day. But I was sent on assignments to all 50 states, um, you know, not just fun, uh, upbeat things like local county fairs and festivals and parades, but hard news assignments and championship sports events I covered. And I met and interviewed all the top newsmakers from entertainment, sports, politics, the arts, you name it. Uh, and I also got to meet ordinary people who had done something extraordinary with their lives. It's the richest professional experience I ever could have imagined. That's part of what I enjoy about this business uh, to a great extent is you get to, to see the people on the street yeah. and talk to them and, and sample what life is like, not under the lights, but basically real life that everybody lives out there. And that's why you can identify with. Absolutely. With you know, they, I was sent out to cover all the natural disasters. You know, I was in hurricanes and floods and blizzards um, and the aftermath of tornadoes. And I saw average everyday people who were suffering great loss and great anxiety because of what had happened to them. And yet, and, and in some cases, th these people lived in communities that had been wiped out by a flood or a hurricane. And neighbors who had not spoken to each other in 10 years would come together and pray together and work together and hug each other and rebuild their lives. And that kind of you know, demonstration of the human spirit and how it will not be defeated uh, was so rewarding and just, I have, probably more vivid memories of those experiences than of you know the encounters with the rich and famous. Well that's part of the, the great part of this business, uh, journalism, and you mentioned Phil Buth. Uh, when we come back, yeah. Phil is actually going to join, join us on set. We're going to talk a little bit about the business, a little bit about your experiences with Phil, and maybe how the business has changed over the course of our careers. Okay. Okay, Sounds we'll be good. right back uh, with Phil Buth joining us right after these messages.